Yeah, yeah, the stylus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like if you have an active stylus or something. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder one, but they're kind of unnecessarily expensive in my eyes. Yeah, I, I just found a good um, art stylus that can do good fine lines and stuff as well. Yeah, I so. have, um, this is the other one that I use because this is this like really cool uh, auto desk. Uh, like oh, I like that color. This is new. <laughs> Usually it's kind of like grayish blue, but today it's like mm, what is this? amber. I don't know. The, the projector, you know, for some reason, just kind of defaults to a kind of weird state. But every time I press the auto setup, it'll fix it. <laughs> so, and, and there's no yeah, yeah, modern lamp you know, yeah, setup yeah, either. Really fine. It's so very good. Just so smooth for mine. <laughs> I dropped my uh, phone in the. Okay, you know, I may, may, maybe I should not have started the recorder, but I dropped it in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped it in the toilet, and then I go like, okay, and I try my best to get to it as quickly as possible and drag it back out. Um, and it worked for another ten minutes, and it died on me. I go like, um, yay! I can upgrade to a five X finally. <laughs> so as I was, you know, you know considering what what. Uh, what, what would be my next phone and so on and so forth. My watch, you know, after maybe half an hour or so, my watch you know, said, oh, you got new text. I'm going like, I'm not getting new text. My phone is dead. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> my phone is not dead yeah. anymore. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 no upgrade. Yeah, oh, no upgrade. <laughs> no upgrade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but these, uh, you know, these, this is, it's, it's just a Nexus 5. It has no, you know, it's, there's oh, no special yeah. power to oh, the, yeah, to the yeah. cell phone. It just, it's just, get, uh, it's just rocket. No, uh, Nexus <laughs> doesn't it, like just because it's Google, it won't give you the new Android. Now. Say again. It won't give you the new Android update. Um, but I have CyanogenMod mod on it. Oh, so, so you, <laughs> he's like they won't give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got my Nexus through um, Google and, and they, got and it and right and away. You still got the updates, so you still run it, you're running six. Um, I'm on um, Nougat right now. Yeah. Okay, Nougat, yeah. I don't. I forget what the nicknames are. Yeah. I just. It, it, I just think that yeah, yeah. they made them all alphabetical. Oh, oh, so. okay. oh, oh that's cool. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it, it took me. It took me a surprisingly long time to figure that out. That was oh, like. Wait. Oh yeah. Right. Like, there was like ice cream sandwich, and then there was jelly bean, which was J. Yeah. No marshmallow, no marshmallow. Um, yeah, and then N. Yeah. No, M. Yeah, wow. So <laughs> yeah. the next one is something got to be O. Yeah, they even went for one. Yeah. Where's the Kit Kat? Oh, that's Then Lollipop, and then. And before that, there was like um, you know, Froyo, Eclair. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. <laughs> So what happens when long. they get to Z? Exactly. Well, um, then you go. You have to go back. They to have to do um, alliteration for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or they, or, or they just subsequently bring out a candy bar that has it. Abba Zappa. Abba Zappa. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we're gonna get started with uh, the lecture today. Um, today we'll stay uh, stay on topic. Try my best. Um, so that we can talk about register banks and also the ALU because we need to somehow because we need to somehow connect the registers to eh? okay coffee now <laughs> we need to somehow connect the registers to the things that is doing the calculation so that's that's the first thing that I want to do is to connect you know, those things together and I'm not even going to bother with a true ALU. In other words, you know, the only thing I'm going to consider is, okay, let's just use an adder, okay? And I'm not even concerned about the carry in. So in this case, I'm just going to put a zero, a constant zero, into the input of the carry because I don't need to use it, but I don't want to leave any input unconnected, right? So we do, we'll change it to a zero, but we still have Two, three connections that are really important. In other words, what, what two numbers am I adding and what am I doing with the output or the sum? Okay, so those are the questions. Um, and we want to do everything with registers at this point. I'm not interfacing with memory just yet because that's a little bit longer, it takes a little more work. But registers should be fairly easy to deal with. And how many registers do you think I need? Or at least how many? 
we need at least two registers, right? Because we need two, we need a, we need two numbers to add, okay? And then we need to store, but we can store back to one of the two numbers, you know, that provides the values. So we need at least two registers. Yes. Are you recording? Um, that's a good question. Mm, yep, yes. Okay, you, you have to look at the recording tab because the input devices is really just showing you what the, what the devices are seeing, but the recording part is telling you which process is hooked up to the input devices. So this is really good. You know, I, I don't know whether Windows has anything equivalent to this, but this is really helpful because I can actually change on a per process basis, you know, which input or output device is connected to when the application is still running. I can just switch it on the fly. So it's, it's really handy in many, many ways. Okay, but this is showing that the process, uh, FFmpeg, which is the utility program that I use for screen recording, is in fact getting, you know, all the uh, audio signals. So this is good. All right, so getting back to this. But the more registers, the better, because the more registers you have, then the more storage you have for temporary results when you're you know, doing calculations. With two, it's kind of like a minimum, but you would, ideally speaking, having more is even better. The Intel processor has, you know, basically, depending on which instruction set we're talking about, if we're talking about the original x86 instruction set, it has, it doesn't really have that many uh, general purpose registers, maybe eight or so, okay? So it requires three bits to specify one of those you know, eight. Okay. So the next thing I'll do is I'm going to slap, you know, like a whole bunch of registers onto this particular design, and then we'll see how to, you know, specify which one to supply their output as the input to the adder. Yes? Are you recording the screen? Um, yes, I am. And I can check that too, because I can actually play the file as it is getting recorded. So I can do a VLC 2016-0930. And of course, it does get a little bit, it gets slightly confusing, right? Because, you know, we are looking at a recording that is still happening as we speak. But it does, it, it does work. <laughs> Unfortunately, the recording cannot show me the future. I wish I could. Then I'll just go look up the stock, you know, ticker and know what the stock to buy. <laughs> <clears throat> But I will still be teaching this class, even if I can you know, become a rich person. But not as rich as Trump. <laughs> rich in a different way. Rich in a different way. Okay, so we're going to um, put a whole bunch of registers into this thing, and then we'll try to figure out some mechanisms so that we can specify what goes into the first input of the adder, what goes into the second input of the adder. So let's go to um, the memory tab, which is where the registers are located. Okay, so we basically just say, okay, let's slap just four of these. Okay, I'm not gonna go too crazy on this. Oh, no, no, I don't need that connection. Go away. All right. Okay, one more duplicate, there we go. All right, so now we have four registers, <clears throat> and I want a mechanism so I can select any two to become the input to um, the adder, and I can select any one of those to store the result of the adder, okay? Now, this is not even close to what is happening inside the processor, because the processor can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but we'll just use this as a starting point, because the focus is not so much what we are doing with the numbers, the focus is more like, okay, how do we select one of these to become, you know, so that its output connect to the first input here, and then this guy's input connects to the second input here. So how do we select those two items, you know, as the input? That becomes the first question. Okay. Say again? You want it to happen simultaneously? You want it to happen simultaneously for both of them? Yes, because, you know, be, because, because ultimately what we are trying to do is to say, okay, sometimes we want a connection like this, okay? But that's only sometimes, right? Because it depends on your actual instruction. Other times we want to do something else. So other times we want the other registers to connect. So 
That means, yep. Mm -hmm. Don't we use a mux? Uh, yeah, we have to use a mux. So I'm, I'm getting, getting that part. So we need some way to basically say, OK, we'll take one of these four as the input to one, and we'll take one of these four as the input to the other one. In other words, we need some kind of a mechanism where this connects, potentially connects to one of these four. And then the other input would be about the same. So the question is, what kind of device can do this? Basically, we have four things that has to merge into one. And I need a mechanism to say, this time I want the first one. This time I want the last one. This time I want the second one, and so on. I need a way to select one of the four registers to feed into the input of the first input of the adder. And then the same thing for the second input to the adder. So to do this, um, we need to get a, we need to go to plexers. And we have a, kind of a several devices that kind of look about the same, but they're not exactly the same. We have a multiplexer, a demultiplexer, decoder, and a bit selector, which is also called encoder. So all of these things are kind of related because they're all doing this sort of thing. They allow you to select one of many things. Or doing the other way, but switching it the other way around, it can also give you, if you have one single input that is active, it can give you the binary representation. Um, the binary representation of the enumeration of the of the input. <clears throat> so in this case, what we need, well, let's take a look at what a multiplexer is. So we pick a multiplexer into the design here. And then we see, OK, this is a multiplexer, but what can it do? All right, so if I just tell you that you know, a multiplexer can get this job done, what are you going to do? Because I have never, ever talked about a multiplexer so far in this class. So what are you going to do? Go to the help tab. <laughs> Yeah, the first thing I would do is to go to the help, go to library reference, and just you know, read the description of a multiplexer, okay? Before I even go online and look for anything else. <clears throat> so we go to here, you know, help, library reference, and then we go to plexers, and then we click multiplexer. Okay, so let's still go ahead and ch check out the description of a multiplexer. So the behavior is it copies an input on the west edge, and it has multiple. It's harder for you guys to see, but there are multiple uh, blue dots on the west side. They're all representing potential inputs. So you can copy an input and input, which means it will pick one of the inputs on the west edge onto the output on the east edge. So there's only one output on the east edge, but there are there can be potentially multiple inputs on the west edge, but it will have to pick one. Which of the inputs to copy is specified via the current value received through the input on the south edge. So the south edge has two inputs. This one here that is blue is the selector. Okay, That's the one that specifies, oh, we want the first one, the second one, and so on. <clears throat> I find it useful to think of a multiplexer as an analogous to a railroad, railroad switch controlled by a select input. Okay, That's one way to look at it. Okay. All right, and then it also further explains, you know, the, what the pins or the ports are. West edge variable inputs, depending on how many inputs you try to you know, merge into one single output. So you can have any power of two, basically. You can have two, four, eight. I cannot remember what is the maximum, but you know, it's only practical up to a certain number when you are using a GUI tool to do this. Um, on the east edge, we have one single output. And the bit width has to match the data bus input because you are talking about a railroad switch, but it's a single direction railroad switch. So if you think about those model air, model trains, so basically what you have here, actually, I, I, I can think of a really, really good uh, picture. So we'll go to uh, Thomas Train Track. See if I can find a really good image on this. It's more like this kind, but you can you can select which one. So this is probably a good one. Okay, the red one here, because you know by pushing the pins you know this way or this way you can select you know, which input track connects to the output track. 
Okay. But you have to remember this is a single direction, which means you can the input is the part that has multiple lines, and then the output is the one part that only has one line. Okay, a, an actual railroad track is not monodirectional or unidirectional, but in this case in electronics, it is unidirectional. Are we doing okay so far? So you can kind of imagine that you can, if, if you if you put two of these things together and have a third one to merge the output of these two, now you can select one of four tracks, and if you replicate a design to, you know, to another one and then have another switch at the end, you can do eight and so on. So you, there's a way to stack these things so they can have you know um, a multiple input into a single output, mm -hmm. not just two into one. <clears throat> okay. Now that is obviously not a very efficient way of doing it, but it's a tricky way and say, okay, if that's the only thing you're given with, is a two to one multiplexer, how do you make an eight to one multiplexer? Well, we just stack a whole bunch of stuff and make it work. Does it make sense? Okay. All right. So getting back to, I was actually hoping to see the uh, the video of you know Thomas Train, you know, getting onto the the carousel, getting back to its. Uh, Home. Okay, you guys are not getting it. You're, you're way too old and way too young at the same time. You're way too young to have kids to watch Thomas Train, and you're too old to watch that show yourself. My kids watch Thomas Train. You do? It's one of the more educational and um, kind of really well suited to children kind of show. <clears throat> huh? Do you mean that blue thing? Yeah, yeah. with the creepy-looking face. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Do you mean that blue train thing with the pretty yeah. uh, Thomas is blue, um, but you know there are different colors as well. You know they have different kinds of trains too, not just steam engines anymore. But the diesel trains tend to be the evil ones, <laughs> bad ones, except for one of the diesel trains. I think that's one of the who's actually doing. <laughs> I still remember, yeah, that's from years ago. Okay, the south edge, you know, right here, the south edge indicated by the gray circle input bit, in gray circle input bit width matches select bits of the attribute. So with eight inputs, we'll need three over here to select one of the eight inputs, okay? If, we, if I have 16 inputs, then I need four bits here to select which one of the outputs. And then there's one more thing here, south edge, right side, input bit width is one, that's the enable. In other words, um, you can merge all of, all of the out input into one, but you, you also have an extra control bit to say, should the multiplexer be driving the output? So you have the ability to say, not to drive the output, or you can say, okay, now drive the output. Uh, that turns out to be really quite useful because it means multiple multiplexers can connect to one single input line of something. And by selecting which one has the output enable, you can actually say, okay, you can make sure that there's no bus fight and yet you can simplify the circuit significantly because of this. All right. So the first thing we'll do, you know, after reading all this stuff here, is just is to just play with that, okay? You know, just to play with a multiplexer and say, okay, do we know what a mo what what it does? So we'll go ahead and go to project and just add a circuit here that I was just named test um, mux, okay? Uh, a multiplexer is also simplified as mux m u x uh, when it comes to electrical engineers, okay? So because apparently multiplexer is taking too long to pronounce, and mux is a lot faster. <laughs> so it's also called a MUX, and a D multiplexer is called a D MUX, by the way. Okay, so we want to just test a multiplexer because we want to test the components that we are using in this particular design. <clears throat> and I'm just going to pick um, a multiplexer here, and you can see that you know you can change the number of select bits. Apparently, we can go all the way up to five select bits, which also means how many inputs are we talking about. 32, exactly. So we can have we can make we can make a mux that can merge any one of the 32 inputs into a single output. I shouldn't say merge, but it will select one of the 32 inputs into the output. So I'm not going to do, go too crazy, you know, with this one. I'm going to only specify two input bits, which allows you four, two select bits, which allows four uh, input channels. Is that okay? Is that making any sense? Okay. 
Um, disabled output is floating, which means it's not driving. Uh, include enabled, yes. Okay, so you can turn it off, which means it is always enabled. If you get rid of the enable bit, then the output is always enabled. You, if you say yes, then you are you have the choice of whether to enable the output or not. Okay. All right. So we'll enable all of these things, and then we'll hook up some inputs. So there will be four inputs, each one matching the width of the of the mux here. And to make this a little bit more fun, we'll select, we'll have you know, four data bits instead of just one. And we have to make sure that our input pin matches that as well, so four here. And we'll make four of these things. One, two, three, four. There we go. Oh, that's one too many. All right, so we'll hook up these to the inputs of the MUX. that and then the output of the mux is going to go to an output pin because from this particular design all we all I want to do is to see what a mux does okay so that we can use it in the previous design and the output pin has to match the width as well so we have to select four bits as the actual output and then we have two extra input pins okay one to select okay this is going to be the selecting and this is going to be in the enable so we'll have two more input pins for those purposes this one is easy it's a single bit but this one here has to be a two-bit input because we have to specify any one of the four inputs it will take two bits to select one of four all right okay so now we have a design all done and let me put some initial values into the input pins so just kind of random stuff here. Okay, the way I put the ones into here is not particularly meaningful. All, I'm, I, all I want to do is to make sure they're all different. That's the only thing. So right now, when you look at the output pin, the output pin says you know, x, 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 which means it's not being driven. Nobody is, say, is specifying what the output is supposed to be because the output enable is a zero. So the mux is actually selecting the first input, which is the one that has the value of 0, 1, 0, 0. It is already selected, but it, it is decided not to let the signal pass through so that nothing is driving the output. And as a result, the output pin is reflecting that and say x, 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 which basically means it is not being driven. Nobody is specifying what it is supposed to be. Are we doing OK so far with this? So that also means if I turn on the enable, turning this zero into a one, then we should see zero one zero zero over here. So let's check that. Okay, sure. Yep. There you go. All right. So now, how do we change the the input? How do I select this zero zero one one as the as the input being selected? Well, we are counting from zero. <laughs> Yeah. Remember, we're coming from zero. So the first one is actually zero, zero. The next one is yeah. zero, one. So the one that, I, that I'm that i highlighting right one now zero, is the one that, is zero, zero. that I put a finger on. That one is one, zero. One, zero. Okay. So let's go ahead and change this select bit to one, zero. And then turn on the open enable. And now the third input is, becomes the content of the output. Are we still doing okay so far with this stuff here? Okay. And can you guys see how this may be useful in our design? Where I have a whole bunch of registers, I need to specify which one becomes the input into the adder, and which one, and just that first, okay? We're not even concerned about storing it back just yet. Is that good so far? Okay, all right. So now that we are done with this sub-circuit, we are going to go back to the main circuit and say, okay, we know, you know we need a MUX here. Okay? So we will just go to the MUX and we specify two bits as the selection and then the data bit is going to be eight because that's the default for the register as well as the default for the adder. And I'm just going to put one right here, make sure that the, we have a connection. I'm just going to move it around a little bit so that I leave some space for the other one. There we go. 
and these four would just become inputs into here. Okay. So now I have a way to specify, you know, which register becomes the input to the atom. What about the other input to the other atom? What about the other input of the atom? Same thing, right? So we just need another mux to specify that. <clears throat> and since I have a mux of the right width and the right number of channels to begin with, so I just duplicate that and stick the output of the second mux into the second input of the adder and then we just have to tap these lines to go into the second mux like so and then this one is easier like that okay there we go and we need a separate control to the select pins because you know, we want all possible combinations of the registers into the adder so the input pins to select um, one of the inputs would be separate for each mux. So this mux will, okay, this is going to look messy because I need to, well, let's see. I suppose I can do it like this. Because <coughs> I can specify that maybe just enough space to do it. Turn this into a two bit input pin. Yep, just enough. There we go. And then we'll duplicate this. Put it down here so that the second box has exactly the same setup. And for this particular design, I'll just say that let's just you know say it is always enabled, okay? Which is not the case, you know, in general. But let's say in this case, you know, we say okay, it's always enabled, which means I don't need an enable pin. So we get rid of the enable pin, okay? It's always connected. And now we can get rid of this thing here, okay? So now we have a design that's almost working. So we want to test this first. So we want to um, connect the output pin, an A bit output pin to the output of the adder to basically see, okay, is this working, okay, at this point? All right, the adder is always outputting. And in this case, you know, all of the registers have zeros. So right now, when you look at the first box, it is selecting the first register as the input to the first input of the adder, which is zero, zero, which is zero. And then the second box is also selecting the first in first register as the input to connect to the output. So that's why we are, well, we, are, we have zero plus zero regardless because all the registers have zeros. So let's go ahead and change things a little bit here just to make it a little bit more fun. <coughs> So we'll go ahead and change this one to, um, let's say, you know, 7E, change this one to D1, and then change this one to um, 9-2. And, okay, so I'll leave the first one as 0, 0, because that's basically why we are seeing 0 as the output of the adder, because we're still adding the first register to the first register and the first register has a value of zero. Zero plus zero is zero. So let's see what happens when I try to add the last two registers. So I want to specify the register with the value of D1 and the register with the value of 92 as the input to the first and the second input of the adder. How do I make that happen? Keep the first one zero. You said you want to add zero, zero, and 92. No, I want to add D1 to 92. So this one, one zero, is going to be one, one zero, one zero, uh huh, and the other the other one is one one, and you can see the moment I change the select bit, the output of the adder changes. Is that making any sense? Okay, but I want to check the output. Does it make sense? Okay, is the adder actually working correctly? Am I you know, picking the right inputs into the adder? So I need to do a sanity check on the output. It is specifying six three at this point. And the way I read this is, once again, we chop the bits into chunks of four, and then every four bit is one hexadecimal digit. And in this case, it doesn't really matter whether it, you, you read from left to right or right to left, because it only has eight, which is a multiple of four. 
But in the case that you do not have a multiple of four bits, then you should read from right to left and then pad the zeros to the left hand side. Okay? But in this case, it doesn't really matter. So the first four or the left four bits you know, specifies a six, and then the right four bits specifies a three, which is six three. And then you do some quick calculations by hand. And you say, okay, we have a D1 plus a 9, 2. What should we get? Okay, 1 plus 2, easy. That's a 3 with no carry. So now we have a D plus 9. A D is basically a 13, and a 9 is a 9. So 13 plus 9 is 22. 22 cannot be represented by a single digit in base 16, because in base 16, a single digit can only represent up to 15. So we have a carry and say, hey, you have to take care of the 16. So out of the 22, the 16 is taken care of by the next digit. So what is left for me to take care of? 22 minus 16 is 6. So 6, 3 in hexadecimal is, in fact, the correct result. So I just did a quick sanity check to make sure that you know, the circuit does work the way it's supposed to. Are we doing OK so far? OK. All right. So now we want to take the output of the adder, and then we say, I want to hook it up back to the registers, because I want one of the registers to store the output of the adding. Okay? Not too concerned about the carry out at this point. I just need the output of the adder to go back and update one of the registers, one of the four registers. What should I do in this case? Would a mux be helpful? A MUX has multiple inputs, one single output, and it selects one of the input to become the output. In this case, we have kind of like an opposite scenario, right? Because we have one input, which is the output of the adder. We have four potential outputs into the D port of the registers. So now we have to say, OK, how do we pick out which one? So you want to You want to take one and you split it out. But it's actually easier than that. Okay, so I'm going to do this using this way, and then you guys will go like, what the, what am I doing? What, what are you doing here, Tag? Because it, it has to do with one, well, two things of registers that I can actually exploit here. Okay? Now, the other thing I want to do is to make sure that none of them are getting zeroed out, so I'm going to attach this zero to all of the reset lines of the registers because I really don't need it in this design. Right. So I'm going to, ah. Oh. So I'm just going to hook up all the zeros to. Does it work this way because registers have uh, the clock mechanism? It uh, has so both the clock and the enable line. And the enable. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to hook up all the reset lines so that we don't Remember, I don't want to leave any input lines, you know, or input ports unconnected, and I'm hooking everything up to zero just so that I don't accidentally, you know, clear the content of the registers. So when you look at each register, I still have two input lines that are not connected yet. So I need to hook up the clock line. Now this part here is basically typically how things are done inside the processor. So I look at all the clock lines, and they are all hooked up to the same single output or single input. There's one system-wide clock line that connects to everything, and this is kind of a part of that. So all of this hook up to one single input pin. Oh, I suppose I should draw that on the other side. <clears throat> so this is my clock line, and let me just label that. C, L, K, there we go. All right, so then tech, you know, we have a big problem now, because you know, we have one single clock line, connected to all the registers. We have one single input or one single data line that also connects to all the input of the registers. So how am I going to select which one is going to get updated? Well, there's one wire left of each register. That one wire left of each register is the enable pin. It says EN next to it on the left edge or the west edge. And that's how we're going to do it, OK? This is how we can select, oh, register 0, you are the one who's supposed to be updated, or register 1, you're the one who's supposed to be updated. But how do we select, OK? Where is this select pin? What, where are the select pins, and how do they connect to these things? Well, we go to the plexers, OK, uh, it, which is still on the screen right now. 
So which one do you think can be helpful in this case? Which one do you think can help me decide, hey, register two, you're the one that needs to pay attention and get updated? Sorry? So it's, it's not going to be a mux, right? Because, because a mux is going in the opposite direction. Because remember, all of these things are unidirectional. So it's going to be a demux, okay? But demux is too much. I don't really need a demux. Because the data line is already connected. If you look at the data line, they're already connected to the output of the adder. So I don't really need a demux. I just need a way to decode. 0, 0 means the first one. 0, 1 means the second one, 1, 0 means the third one, and then 1, 1 means the last one. And that thing is called a? Which, which, which device here has the shape of a DMUX, but is not called a DMUX? A decoder. decoder. A decoder, very good. So we just need a decoder to do this, okay? So we'll hook up a decoder, and I need to move all of this to the right-hand side a little bit that okay <clears throat> and then we have room for a decoder now okay so what is a decoder how does it work what am, what are we dealing with here tech reference, reference help okay so we go to the library reference and then we go to a decoder and just read a little bit about it so the behavior or the general description of a, de of a decoder is emit one, okay, the, the signal of one or high signal, one exactly one output out of multiple. Which output is a one depends on the current value received through the input on the south edge, which is our select pin. In other words, it's almost like a demux, which is the reverse version of a mux, except the output is always a one, which is all I need, because I just need to select which register has an enable of one. Okay. All right. So when you go back to this design here, I need to change it a little bit because I have two select pins so that I can specify any one of the four outputs to be one. And you have to remember in this case, one and only one output will be a one, the rest would be zeros. Okay, that's how a decoder works. And then the pin here, this pin with a gray circle on top, this is the one that tells me which one of the four output is going to be the one where the rest is going to be zeros. Okay. Okay. So that means so that's our selector. That's our selector pin. Hmm? That that gray one is our selector pin. Yes. So this so these pins basically just connect to the enable pin of the registers. And it's still in blue because the output enable is you off. You missed the top one. Okay. You missed the top one. Just get the top one. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, nope. Okay, it's better to draw it this way. So I don't, uh, mm, no. Even though in this case it doesn't really matter because you know you can fly over wires all day long, it just looks better this way. Okay, so the reason why these are blue is because in a decoder you also have an enable pin for the output. In other words, you see this part here, include enable, and if you select yes, that means we have an enable pin here. If the enable pin itself is off, then no one is going to drive any one of the output. In other words, at this point, the outputs are not even driven high or driven low, which is not good, because I don't want anything to be not driven to the register's inputs. So I probably either want to hook up the enable pin to something that's always on, or in this specific case, because I'm not actually using it for any purposes, I'll just turn it off. So this way, you know, they're always selecting something on the output. <clears throat> And they're still blue because I haven't really selected anything, so I wouldn't. I want to connect this to um, another input pin that has two bits. And you can see that now your know, one is asserted to be a one, and it's the first one because you know it is zero zero as the selected into the decoder, and as a result, you know, zero output zero is now asserted, but everything else is are zeros.
Is that okay so far? Okay. So if I want the result to be stored back into um, one of the registers supplying the content, let's say we want you to know, register one zero, then we can just say, okay, one zero over here. So now I'm selecting the same register that supplied one of the values that we are adding to also store the result of the addition. This is the typical thing inside an Intel processor um, when, you, when you are specified to add instruction one of the sources would also be the one storing the result of the result of the of the addition. Is that okay? Yep. How do you prevent it from re-adding um, like a loop? That okay, that's a very good question. Let me just kind of repeat the question so it's recorded. So how do I make sure that this uh, this doesn't fit into a loop of you know, okay, I'm adding and then the result is reflected right away into the output pin, it feeds back into itself, then it gets updated again. And then we add again. This is all because the update of a register is edge sensitive. So only on the rising edge it's going to change, but once it changes, it's locked in place. It doesn't change anymore until the next rising edge. Is that okay? All right. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Okay. So we say it's clock. The clock is low right now. So the moment I click it again, which will generate a rising edge then D1 should be changed to 63 to store the result of the addition. But at the same time, because the output changes right away, this would be this would become a 63 plus 92, which is something five. Okay? So we'll observe that. Click here. You can see this is updated to 63, and this one is definitely a five because 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 is a five. And this, in fact, is a F5 because we have 1111, which is F, and then 0101 is a 5. So the circuit does work, and then we clock, you know, because it's called a clock signal, you know, it is usually, you know, going in a particular cyclic way. So are we doing okay so far with this circuit, or are there any questions about specific components? Yes? Uh, can you kind of explain what the second mux is? The second mux? The bottom. You mean? This mux here? Yes. This is, it serves the same purpose as kind of the first mux because um, an adder has two inputs. So the first mux handles, you know, um, basically it specifies which of the register connects to the first input of the adder. And then the second mux, you know, handles the second input of the adder. Hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Ooh, I have a question. What is inside a decoder? What does it look like inside a decoder? Is it something that we should know already at this point, or is it some kind of mysterious mumble jumble, uh, timey wimey thing that uh, only a time lord you know, would understand? Timey wimey thing. It's a timey wimey thing. Something, no. something we should know already, right? Okay. So without the enable pin, okay, which is you know, kind of the the enable pin is a little bit harder, a little bit harder. But without the enable pin, it is something that we can do already. Okay. Can we use like a splitter? Yeah, it's like a. Splitter. It's not a splitter. A splitter is not conditional. In other words, a splitter is really just physically you're know, splicing a bundle of wires into individual wires or combining individual wires into a bundle, which in this case is not going to be helpful because we 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 need the function of a of a of a switch and say, okay, only you are connecting, only you are connecting, or in this case, you know, we are only having one single bit to be, to be a one, and all the other bits are supposed to be zeros. Yes? Well, can't gates. we use a splitter with AND gates? Yes. Yeah. Not quite a splitter, but, it, but yes, AND gates. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want, look, we want to look at this specific decoder and say, can we implement this using our own logic stuff, okay, instead of, draw, instead of using the library component, can we make a decoder? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So we add a circuit and we call this decode 2x4, which means we have two select pins, four output pins. Okay. Alright, so let's see how we can do this. And we'll start with the number of input pins. Okay, so here we have two input pins. So I'm not using a splitter to split a two bit wire into two bits. You know, we just specify two individual input pin input pins. And then we have four output pins, one, and then duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. Okay. 
So we got four output pins, and let me just go ahead and label the output pins. So the first one is out zero, out one, out two, and out three. And then the select pins are labeled as cell or select zero and select one. Now the, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, which would be the most significant bit here? Cell zero or cell one? Um, cell zero is the least significant okay. bit and then cell one is the most significant bit. In other words, the, the number indicates the bit number of, the, of a multi-bit value. Okay. All right, so what can we do here? When both of these are zeros, I want this guy to be an output. When we have a zero one, we want this to be a one and everything else to be zeros. When we have a one zero, we want this to be out, when we want this to be a one and then everything else to be a zero. And then when we have a one one, we want the last one to be a one and everything else to be a zero. Hmm. We just need a bunch of AND gates with potentially negated inputs, right? Yeah, four AND gates, yep. Well, hmm. it is a bunch. Hopefully <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of AND gates. Because it's more than one. It's a bunch. <laughs> okay, so we go to logic. Okay, we go to gates here. And then we just specify AND gates. And, and we don't need a big old AND gate here. We just need one AND gate with two inputs. And we can make it a narrow one so it doesn't take up as much space. And we need four of these, okay, so we just say, let's make four of these things, there we go, okay, the last one is the easy one, because the last one does not need anything negated, we need, because, because we want one one as select bit to turn on out three, okay, that's an easy one, because they just, they don't need, be, they don't need to be negated, okay, so I'm going to Hook up this wire here, non-negated, hook up this wire here, also non-negated, and hook up the output of this to out three, and we test it, okay? So we go test it. If both inputs of the select bits are ones, ah, out three is, out is, it is a one, excellent. We got that working. Okay, what about the first one? The first one is supposed to turn on negated, when negated. both inputs should be negated, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we want out zero to be a one, when cell zero and cell one are both zeros, okay? So when, when you have a regular NAND two gate, excuse me about the NAND two, a regular AND gate where both inputs are negated, it will accomplish what we need to do, okay? So let's go ahead and see if that works, okay? So we look at this one here, and then we say, let's negate the first input, let's negate the second, up, second input as well, and then we just, you know, we just use a bus concept because, you know, everything connects the same way. And then we look at the output, output over here. This is okay, this is correct, because when the if select input is one one, it's supposed to be off. But it should turn on when I, when, I turn when I change the select pins to zero, zero. Okay, so let's check it out. Aha, that works. And the last one turns to zero, because you know, we only want one and only one of the pins to be a one, and the rest are supposed to be zeros. Okay, so these two are the easy ones because both inputs have the same treatment, okay, because the bits are exactly the, the same. So let's look at this guy here, the one in the middle here. This is supposed to turn on when select zero is a one and select one is a zero, okay? Select zero is a one and then select one is a zero. Yep, so what we... So we're gonna negate the second one and keep the first one non-negated. So we'll go ahead and negate the second one. And I'm gonna hook up the wires the same way. In other words, you know, this wire is always going to the second input and then this one's always, oops, ah, nope. The other one goes to the first one. Hook it up like this. Let's test it. Okay, so we want to say zero, one. Ah, this one is a one and everything else is a zero, so we're almost done. Let's deal with the last one, which is really the flip side of the first of the of the one right above that. So with this one we want to negate the first pin and leave the second pin non-negated. So we'll draw the connections here. So we got one here, and then we got one here, and ah, it's not aligned. 
Yeah, you can just drop out to one level. What? You just move out to a little lower. Yeah, we could have done that. Perfection. Art history. This is not an art class. If you want an art class, you go take an art new media class. No, that's art. Just the way it is. Yeah. Hmm? That's fine. I'll tell you. That's art. That's just the way it is. Okay, so we have the whole thing set up, but it's time to test it. How many test cases do we have in this particular design? Four. Only four test cases, okay? So let's go ahead and test all four cases here. Zero, zero, out zero is, output is the only one with an output of one, good. Zero, one, only the second one has an output of one, everything else are driven, but they are all zeros. One, zero, has output two being a one and everything else being zeros, and then one one has the last one being a one, everything else being a zero. Well, guess what? We have a two bit decoder now. What about a three bit decoder? Well, just this bigger and everything has three inputs. Yep. So, how does it now play with the um, enable pin? Now, the enable pin is basically putting a gate on all of these things. So, to do that, you need to have a buffer. And a buffer looks kind of like a, no, that's not a buffer. I need a buffer that has a, it's a gated or controlled buffer. There we go. So this is a buffer, and a buffer is kind of like a, it's kind of like a clutch. So you have input, you have output, but then you also have a control of whether the output is being driven or not. So you can disconnect the input from the output so that the output does not get, is not driven anymore. Yep, go ahead. You just have an AND gate instead of a buffer on every output? An AND would not do it because an AND is still always driving the output, but the enable pin is supposed to basically say you know, do not drive the output. An AND gate is always driving the output, it's just you know, whether it's a zero or a one. It can control the polarity of the output, but it cannot control whether it's driven or not. And output enable really should be controlling whether the line is driven or not. And as a result, it can only be done by a controlled buffer or otherwise known as a gate in the buffer. Yep, go ahead. So a zero still still a question? Okay, a zero still drives the line? Yes, a zero is still driving. It's just that, you know, because, okay, um, let me answer the next question and then go back to what is being driven, okay? Yep. Uh, does this design still work with a single two bit input? A single two bit input. Because yeah, right now you have two single bit inputs. Yes. Does it work the same way as one two-bit input? Like if you had a two-bit input and then you had like a... Like a D-Mux? So with a D-Mux, you basically have multiple of these things, but you will be ending um, the output with the input. So that way the output is reflecting the actual state of the input. Because when you have a decoder, it's only got one input. A decoder has no input. In other words, it's not controlling what input is getting passed through to the output. It is actually just specifying which line of the output is a one. Right. But right here, you've got two input bits, right? Right here, we've got two input, input bits, bits, but they're called selection bits. Right. Mm -hmm. And in your design, he's saying you have a two bit, just one. Here we have two one bits. In your design, you have one two bits. In the actual tool. Right, in the actual two, but the only difference is, you know, I'm merging these two into a single pin, that's all. Right, so it would look the same? It would so work the same way. Okay, I, I, I think I understand your question. Let me, let me change the design to, to, be, to resemble what we're dealing with, you know, the actual um, multiplexer. Yeah. Okay, so to make this resemble the actual multiplexer, we would basically get rid of these two pins, okay, replace it with a single input pin that has two bits. But then we'll need to use a splitter to split it into two individual bits. So we go to wiring, pick out a splitter, and split into two, exactly. So this would be the least significant bit. It is supposed to hook up to the top wire. Sorry? Yeah. It's not our car. And then the, the second one goes to the second wire. There we go. So we'll check it. We'll check it again. 
I think I think that's should that's what you should do it. Zero one, one zero, and then one one. So that's how you know. So it's it's really just a matter of how you look at the input. Do you want to look at two? Do you want to look at it as two individual input pins, each pin having only one bit, or do you want to look at it as one single input pin that has two bits? And then we just use use a splitter to break it out into individual wires. But the other question, I also want to address that, you know, is zero driven or not? Zero is driven. If you say it is a zero, it is driven. Because somebody is saying, okay, it is now in a low state. Okay? So it, zero does not mean it's not driven. Let me give you an example of you know, what is driven and what is not. Okay? So think of, think of a, a scenario like this. You have a you know, high state here, you have a low state here. Okay? And a wire, without attaching, being attached to anything that drives the input or the output, is kind of like you know, spring connected to both the high or the low. In other words, it can kind of like you know, bounce around a little bit because it, there's a springiness to it. This is not driven. Is that okay? So when you're driving, it means somebody is actually exerting force to push it to the low state. If it's driven high, it means somebody is actually exerting force to push it to the high state. Yep. And you see plus plus would that be similar to like uh, you haven't um, initialized your variable? There's no real equivalence in C++ because in C++ an uninitialized variable still has a state. It is just not known at the time. So it's not really floating. Oh. This is actually floating, which means you know, nobody is actually specifying what it is supposed to be. Is it supposed to be high? Is it supposed to be low? So nope, it can be, it's just floating. So the architecture wouldn't read a value from it? It wouldn't be able to pull out a value and say it's That's a good question. If you're reading something like this, then it's up to the semiconductor device to interpret this rotation and say, okay, should I interpret this rotation as a one or should I interpret this rotation as a zero? Now that gets really, really tricky because when you read the specification of most semiconductor components, they will tell you, okay, so let's say this is a voltage range you know, between a perfect zero and a perfect one, okay? So the specification of most semiconductor will give you a fresh code and say everything about this, or at least this much, is guaranteed to be interpreted as a one. And then will tell you everything that is below this is guaranteed to be interpreted to be a zero. What about the in-between things? Doesn't say a single thing about it. It can be a zero, can be a one, can can flip you know, between the one and the zero as frequently as it wants. <laughs> right? That kind of blows my mind because that's, that's, that's three states. And therefore tri-state, okay? In, in uh, case you haven't- That's what that is down there? Yep, oh, the tri-state thing, you know, it's kind of like saying, is it driving high, is it driving low, or is it not being driven at all? So the buffer works where if that bottom line is a one, then it's sending out output, and if it's a zero, it's right. not? Right, right. So you just attach that to all the ends? Yes. So you would have four gated buffer, or four, they call it, um, they, they don't call it gated, they call it. Um, you said controlled? Controlled. Yeah, they call it controlled buffer, but it's the same thing as what we call a gated buffer as well. So when you have four controlled buffers, one to each output, but the control line is all this one, one single one. Right, right. So, when, so when it's disabled, you, you basically disable all the outputs. Gotcha. Makes sense. Okay. Any questions about the uh, decoder that encode two bits into four individual bits? Any questions? All right, excellent. So we go back to uh, the main circuit. Let's go back to the main circuit here. And are there any other questions about this main circuit? How do you use the result of a register? Yeah, because, okay. because it's not really going to encounter it. No, because right now we are just dealing with, so we are, I'm designing a processor from the inside out. So I start with the very, very core of a processor, which is the circuitry that actually do the computation. 
but it's useless just to know how to do computations because we need something to supply the values to the computation and something to store the value of the computation. And hence we have the registers. But the registers, there are so many different registers, we need a mechanism to select, okay, which one should go to the first input, which one should go to the second output, and what do we do with storing the result? So that's what this design is. So all of these eventually will be connected to a larger circuitry where it can interface with memory. So then you can start to store you know, values into memory, load values from memory to do the computation. And then um, once we have subtraction, we have the capability of comparing. And once you can compare, you can look at the result of comparing and say, should I just move on to the next instruction or should I go all the way around and go to that instruction over there? So that is where things get a lot more interesting. But right now, all we are focusing on is just, okay, can we do, can we add, can we subtract, can we multiply, okay, and so on. Are we doing okay so far with this? Yes? At what point are we gonna make this useful? Because I know- It is already semi-useful. <laughs> <laughs> it is a part of the gigantic music box that we know as the processor. But at this point, you know, we are only focusing on one portion. We are growing the processor from the, the from the inside out, from the really the core part of it that actually do all the calculations, and we are expanding it out at one step at a time, so that we can say, okay, now that we can do calculations, we can store the result in the register. Can we store the register into memory? That would be the next question. Okay. I guess what I'm wondering, because I'm using your, your analogy of the classroom and, 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 and you know, the, the registry being kind of like the okay. papers that you got written in front of you. And, mm -hmm. um, I, guess, I guess what I'm wondering is where do the instructions come in? Ah, very good. So, you know, where does the von Neumann architecture comes in, you know, into this picture, right? We are, we are not quite there yet because we are, we are looking at things that the processor can do, but we are not quite looking at things that will say, oh, if that memory location is 01001100, zero, 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 one, one, zero, 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 then we want to add the two register and store that into the third register. We haven't really quite get to the, the decoding of instructions yet. Okay, so we are, we are, we're quite a bit of, of uh, distance, you know, there's some distance between what we're doing here and the actual part where we will we'll be starting, ex we'll start to execute instructions. But these are the building blocks. We are making things bigger and bigger and more and more complex uh, with each step. Any other questions? Okay, so I made this one of the homework assignments in one semester. I'm not gonna do it in this semester. Um, and the, the, the project is to make a multiplier, a, a hardware multiplier. Okay, we kind of touched on that a few classes ago, I think. Okay, so we want to do it, you know, using you know the basic components that we already know, you know, and see how we can do a multiplier. Okay, so before we do that, okay, let me just kind of re-emphasize what multiplication is, and I'm going to use a four-bit multiplier. Okay, so four-bit and four-bit as the numbers to be multiplied, and then the result is going to be an eight-bit result. Okay. So let's say you know it is they are represented by A B C D, which is one number, and we want to multiply this to A B C D E F G H E F G H. Okay. So what do we do with this addition? It's multiplication, but multiplication in binary is a lot easier, okay? Because when you look at okay, what what should I put here? What should I, what I should put here is E times A, E times B, E times C, and E times D, right? But because it's binary, multiplication like this, where it is one bit multiplied by another bit, is guaranteed to be what? If you are multiplying two numbers, each number can only be a zero or one. The so-called multiplication is otherwise known as? It's an and. It's an and, very good. So it's a conjunction. So this dot here is actually both meaning a arithmetic multiplication, but at the same time, it really is just a conjunction, an and gate. Do we know how to do and gate? Yes. 
What about the next row? The next row, you know, well, I could pick any of these uh, digits, but it makes more sense to be going in, in one particular direction. So the next one is gonna be F times A, B, C, D. So it's F, A, F, B, F, C, and then F, D. Does that make any sense? What do I do with these eight bits? Add them. Just add them, okay? So this is gonna be by itself, because you know, there's nothing here to add to this one. So this is just your FD all by itself. And the rest, we can use an adder to do this. Okay, we can use a five bit adder to deal with this. Okay, so I'm not gonna you know, show the details of how we get to these five bits here. And then what do we do? We look at G, right? So we say, okay, this is GA, GB, GC, and then we have a GD over here. I think I got it misaligned a little bit. There we go, but basically the same idea. So we take the output of the first adder, and then we have this particular thing here out of the conjunctions, add them together. This will require a six bit adder. Because we have one extra bit here, okay? What did we do with that? Well, we have H here. So the final row is gonna be HA, HB, HC and HD over here, and then we have now a a bit adder to add all of these numbers together. And then the final result after adding all of this is going to be the product. <coughs> so by combining the use of conjunction or AND gates, because we need the AND gates here, and also the use of adders, which we already know how to do, we can now make a multiplier. Is that okay? But is this any different from how you do calculations, how you do multiplication longhand in base 10? Yeah. It is different, this is easier. <laughs> because in longhand multiplication in base 10, you, don't, you cannot use a conjunction, you cannot use an AND gate to do with these, these numbers here. Because you actually have to look up the multiplication table in your mind to deal with these individual multiplications. But in base two, the multiplication table is trivial. There's nothing to look up. So how would we apply an AND gate to that? Well, let's go ahead and make it, shall we? Yeah. So let's make a four bit by four bit hardware multiplier, okay? So let's go ahead and say, add a new circuit. We'll call this a four by four multiplier, okay? So we'll start with a four bit input. Now, whether you want to turn these into individual bits or not, you know, I just like it to be a four bit input and then split it later on. So we have two of these as inputs, okay? So I'll call the first one X, which is one of the inputs. The second one Y, which is the other input, okay? And we know that we have to split this into multiple things. <clears throat> and then we have to re-merge stuff, okay? So I'm not too concerned about you know, splitting it at this point. I look at this picture, okay, and I say, okay, we need to access individual bits of A, B, C, D, and then multiply that by E, and it looks like they're doing the same thing to F, to G, and then to H. In other words, I'm using one bit of one number to end with all the bits of a second number, and we have the same thing happening over and over again, okay? In other words, if I were to do this you know, individually, I would probably have to copy and paste a few times. Is that making any sense? because it's the same kind of circuit, except you know, one applies to bit E, one applies to bit F, one applies to bit A, G, and then the other one applies to bit H. Every time you do copy and paste, you have to ask yourself, is there a better way to do it? Because copy and paste is really an indication of potential problems, okay? Because if you copy and paste and you, you find a problem after that, then you have to fix all of the replications. So I don't want to do that, I want to abstract this out. So I'm going to do a simple, you know, additional circuit, and it's just a one by four multiplier. In other words, I'm multiplying a four-bit number by a one-bit number. But that's <coughs> that's easy, right? Okay, let, let me let me show you the circuit, and then you guys will go like, okay, that's easy. Okay, so this is the four-bit number. This is the one-bit number. So once again, I label one as x, label the other one as y. And I want the result p to be the product of these two. 
So the output is going to be a 4-bit number because potentially I can multiply the 4-bit number by 1 where I get the original number back. Is that okay? But how does this work? 4 AND gates. 4 AND gates. Very good. Okay, so we need 4 AND gates and a splitter okay, and a merger at the end. So you can also... Okay, I really should not use that <laughs> because when you use an AND gate, you can actually specify the number of... Um, bit size too but that's kind of cheating I don't want to do that okay I want to do it the I want to do it the hard way which is one of the trademark of my classes if there's a harder way to do something I'll find it and do it that way <laughs> <laughs> the difficult part is to find it first Usually, I lose about 25% you know, of the class at the moment I say that. It's like they, all, they all flock and walk out of the classroom. Okay, so we have four edits here, okay? I mean, four uh, end gates here. So the first thing I need to do is to split this into four individual wires, okay? So we go to the wiring part, pick out a splitter, and we need a four-way splitter. So we need, to, we need a fan-out ratio of four, but first I need to change the number of bit width to exactly four. And then we say, okay, we want to fan out of exactly four because each bit is important in this case. So this one is easy. I don't need to do much about that. I'm just rearranging things so that it would look semi-decent when we look at the actual picture. So this one goes all the way to the bottom here. This one goes to this one. That one goes over there. And then this one goes, oops here and because they're being multiplied by the second number which is a single bit number so this one single bit just goes to all of the second input of every single conjunctions so we multiply everything by that by the second number then we just need a merger which is the reverse version of this splitter so we just duplicate this move it over here change the facing so now it faces west so now we can merge the four outputs back into one. I just have to be careful and make sure that the you know, bit zero matches bit zero here because I don't want that to flip. Okay, so we look at this, and then we hook up that, and we hook up this, hook that up, and oops. Okay, looks ugly, but I'm gonna just let it do it. Okay, fine. Okay, let's check it. Okay, so let's test this. 0 times 0 is 0. Does that make sense? Sort of. How about 0 times uh, 101? It's also a 0. Seems to make sense. How about 1 times 101? I'm getting 101 back. Seems to work. Okay. All right. So we have a sub-circuit working now. So now that we have a sub-circuit working, we can go back to the actual multiplier and say, okay, what am I going to do with these you know, sub-circuits? How many of these sub-circuits do we need? Potentially we need four, but we can do away with three because the last one, well, actually, I take it back, we, we do need four because we need to multiply each bit by those things. So we need four of those things. So we look at these multipliers and then we say we need four of these. Okay, so we just duplicate, 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 duplicate. And you can see I'm putting things all over the place because I just want to put all the things that I need on the screen first, okay, and then I'll find a way to arrange all of these things. What other components do I need? We need, add we need adders, okay? How many adders do we need? We have four components, which means we only need three adders. Very good, okay. But the adders have varying width, okay? The first one is a five bit, second one is a six, the third one is a... They increase by one. They increase by one, yep. Okay, so we have to be careful with that. So we need some adders, okay? So I'm gonna pick out some adders here. I may not be able to be able to. I may not be able to finish this today. We'll see how far we can go. <clears throat> what about in lab, or you have something else planned? Oh yeah, we can do it in the lab. So we can finish this in the lab. Very good. Okay, so we have we have several adders. We have one thing that is the result. And how wide the re should I use? How wide is the result? Eight bit. It should be a bit because. 4 bit can specify values up to 15, right? 15 times 15 is 225. And how many bits do I need to represent 225? 
and the 8 bit, because 7 bit can only represent up to 127. So that means anything that is more than 127 will require more than 7 bits. 8 bits can represent all the way up to 255. So I'm, I'm okay there. Okay. okay, so we need um, an output. And I know the output is going to be an 8 bit output because we have two, you know, uh, 4 bit inputs. So at this point, we have, you know, all the kind of major components here. One of the numbers can feed directly into the 4 by 1 bit, you know, multipliers you know, without having to break out anything. So I'm just going to kind of pick X to be that one. So X doesn't need to be broken out. But Y needs to be broken out into individual bits because that's the one that feeds into the single bit input of each of the 4 by 1 bit multipliers. So I know this one needs to be split into individual bits. It's going to be a 4 bit wide and we need a full 4 output fan out. So we know that we need to split Y into 4 individual bits. X can remain as it is just a 4 uh, bit wire. Okay, so we have the basic stuff done here. We also know how each of these is going to be hooked up. Okay, so we know that X is going to go into every single one of these. So the way I, I write this or the way I draw this is going to be a little bit sta sta uh, staggered. Okay. Because it's, it's kind of like on the board, right? Yep, exactly. So bit three goes into this one here. I know this doesn't look good, but. But I want to preserve the ordering. And then this one, mm, okay. <laughs> Slider. Now I can, I can move these guys. There we go. And put this one over here, okay? Does everybody understand what Y is? Because Y is the second number. I have to break out the individual bits into B, F, G, H, and feed those individual bits into the four by one multipliers. X, on the other hand, is A, B, C, D, and they are bundled every single time, so they can feed into the in the four by one bit um, multipliers without having to be split into individual parts. So we just hook it up like this. Ah, incompatible with. Okay, that's fine. I'll fix that later because they all need to be fixed anyway. Okay, so now we have you know, the basic setup you know, but without the adders involved. So now we need to think about, okay, how do we use the adders? Okay, so we have, so right now, let me just highlight on the, on the whiteboard which pieces we have done already. We got this piece, we got this piece, we got this piece, and then we got this piece here. But we're missing all the adders at this point. So I need to hook up the output of these you know, four by one bit uh, multipliers into. Um, okay, let me let me see the why. The first two one by fours <coughs> go into the first adder, and the output of the first adder, and the third one by four connect to the second adder. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, but I have to fix this first. You know, I made a mistake yeah. somewhere. Oh, I flipped the bits. I flipped the wires. The individual goes to the one, which is the bottom. It doesn't like it. Hmm. Pretty sure that's the way it's designed. The single bit goes to the bottom. Well, ink. okay, this is also a good way to illustrate how to troubleshoot. You know, when you encounter problems like this, what do you do? Have you tried turning it on? Turn it on again? Kick the computer a few times. <laughs> Curse at the computer. Or as one of my colleagues did, you know, um, this is back before we had wireless mouse mice. So he threw the mouse across the room. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I think code rage is not going to be very helpful here. So what oh, you no, do, right okay? So this you is. You screwed up right there. Huh? Yeah. What? what? That orange wire should be connected to the. Oh no, that's right. 
Well, it claims this is a four-bit thing, but it's, it's a one-bit thing. Why is a one-bit thing? So this is how I, I'm going to solve the problem, okay? Or I think I can solve the problem like this. So we'll, we'll give it the name, you know, mode4x4, okay? We close the project, okay? And then we go back. <laughs> and then we go back and see, okay, there we go. Start it up again. Uh, open recent and go back to my 4x4 four four multiplier. It's still complaining. Oh, oh I know exactly what's happening. These two, the two pins are connected. That's why it, it's just, it doesn't show because it is next to the, the blue thing. Okay, so I, I'll show you guys what I mean by that. It's just really hard to see. That's why it is. That's why without any wires connected, it still complains about width incompatibility because <laughs> if you look very, okay, we're getting there. If you look very, very closely, if you zoom all the way in, I, I'm not sure whether you guys can see it, but I can see it on my screen, yeah. is these two pins are actually connected. <laughs> so that was, a, that, that was a snafu. Okay, now it's much more obvious. <laughs> So no wonder, okay, so now that I know what the problem is, I will continue this, you know, in the lab, okay? So for those of you who want to kind of follow this, you can go to the lab, and, and the best part is you can keep asking questions, you know, when you're there. So I'm going to stop the recorder here.